Welcome back guys. Today is going to be a lot of fun because I'm going to show you a recipe that I wouldn't normally hand out. This is a family recipe. In fact, it's a completely unedited version of my granny's, one of her most famous dishes. Today we're making country fried steak. Country fried steak or chicken fried steak, depending on what part of the country you're from. I'm from the country fried part, so if you're from chicken fried, good on you, is really just a breaded and fried piece of rather tough beef. It's usually eye of round or top round, something that doesn't have a lot of fat in it and that naturally on its own is not very tender. However, you put it through a few steps and out comes something absolutely majestic. So let's walk through the ingredients as usual, kind of give you a heads up of what we're working with and then we'll get started on the prep. So front and center right here is my beef and what I have is beef top round that has been cubed or cubed steak as it's called and you can see here that it has thousands of little tiny chopped up holes in it that is from the process of cubing as the name implies it literally goes through a machine with teeth that puncture it thousands of times over and that is manually tenderizing this it means that this piece of beef that previously was something that would get stuck in your teeth is now going to be quite a bit more tender I have tons of it because we're going to have it for dinner tonight as a family. So you won't need this many. You need basically one steak per person. Over here on my left, I have buttermilk, full fat, old school, real buttermilk. This is not the time to use the El Cheapo stuff. It just frankly doesn't taste as good and it won't work out to the end product. I also have some all-purpose flour. I'm using uh, King Arthur. It happens to be organic, doesn't have to be by any means. I have baking soda and baking powder. You need both of those for this recipe and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I have my seasonings here and I went out and bought literally the same exact brand that my granny always had. So this is McCormick brand and we have black pepper pre-ground by the way and that is kind of important. We have garlic powder, onion powder, cayenne pepper, couldn't get McCormick so I got Publix brand and of course accent powder, otherwise known as MSG, cornerstone to traditional Southern cooking. So I'm gonna move all this out of the way. We're gonna mix up our seasonings and a few of our ingredients, and then we're gonna get cooking. Okay, first things first, the seasoning for this. Now, we use something that in our restaurants, we just call this chicken seasoning because it's the same thing that goes on our fried chicken at Revival. And so I'm gonna show you guys the recipe for this. It's a little bit of a secret, clearly not that much since I'm about to show you, but we use this across the board on tons of stuff. And you'll see that in this recipe today, we're gonna to use it multiple times. It's pretty easy to remember. Salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, MSG, cayenne pepper. And it doesn't matter how much you're mixing up, it's again all about ratio. So in this case, it's three parts salt, and so I'm going to use a tablespoon. So that means three tablespoons of kosher salt. Then it's two parts black pepper. So let's see if we can make this. Nope, won't work. So I'm going to screw the lid here. Two parts black pepper. So two tablespoons of that. It is one part each garlic powder, onion powder, and believe it or not, cayenne pepper. It has a lot of that in there. So it's got some kick to it. So I'll just start with my cayenne since it's over here on the side. By the way, if you're not a person who likes spicy, if you go, wow, that sounds way too hot, just back down on the cayenne. I mean, you could go as low as a quarter of a part, and I still think it would be quite delicious. My family tends to like spicy food, though. So a tablespoon of each of these. And then our last ingredient is the MSG part to it. Now, thankfully, when I've shown you guys this before in other videos, I haven't actually gotten nearly as much hate for it as I thought, but MSG factors in a lot in old school Southern cooking. I'm not, I'm not talking about like the antebellum period of the South. I mean like the Southern cooking of post-World War II. This stuff shows up a lot. And the reason is that it takes the place of an ingredient that previously showed up a lot in really old-fashioned Southern cooking, and that was dried and cured and fermented foods. And so this packs that same umami flavor of ingredients that maybe were a little bit harder to get um, in the more modern era. So we are going to add to this about one quarter part. So in this case, about a quarter of a teaspoon. You definitely want to take it easy with this. Um, if you have too much MSG in it, well, it's not delicious. It starts to get to the point where you can like taste your own tooth enamel. So a little bit goes a long way. So let's stir this together, set this aside, 
and let's start making the different components that we need for our chicken fried steak. All right, so the first thing we need to get ready for our chicken fried steak is actually the fat we're gonna cook it in. So that's why I have out my big giant cast iron skillet. This is from Lodge. I have no idea how old this is because I inherited it and I don't know how long my grandmother had it before me, but this is a chicken frying pan. It's super deep and it's filled with fat right now. And that fat is one half vegetable shortening, Crisco, and one half lard. That's what's in here right now. Now, I didn't make that up. That's just what she preferred to cook in. And I'm not sure if there was an exact reason. My guess is that probably the Crisco stretched the lard and made it last a lot longer than just using pure lard. Not really 100% sure. You could certainly omit Crisco. You could go full Crisco. I've done it, it tastes delicious. Or you could go full lard. What I wouldn't do is move to vegetable oils. They simply don't have the density needed to create the really flavorful coating to this. Plus we're gonna use this fat to make our gravy. So it goes a long way. Now, here is the secret step that makes all the difference. My grandmother would turn the heat on up to about medium and she would add a slice of smoked bacon into the pan. And when the bacon started frying in the pan, that's when she knew that the grease was hot enough for her to fry her steaks in. Plus, the added benefit is that your grease now takes on a little bit of that smoked bacon flavor, which is, well, fantastic. So the way we bread these country fried steaks is sort of interesting. We go into plain flour, and then we go into a wet mixture, which is what I'm gonna show you right now, and then back into flour, and then straight into our frying pan. And what happens is that this wet mixture will actually cause the flour and stuff like that to kind of puff on the outside. Let me show you why. So we start with our buttermilk. Now I'm gonna use half of this container of buttermilk, or two cups, by the way. So I'm gonna eyeball it in this case, since it is already measured out for me, I don't feel the need to get another measuring cup dirty. There we go, two cups of buttermilk. Now, into our two cups of buttermilk, we're gonna put one egg. I forgot that ingredient in the lineup. Hopefully it's not a big deal. Add that in here and just give this a quick whisk up. The egg in here really kind of just makes it more rich, gives it a little bit more viscosity and improves the sort of ability for it to stick. Also, the caramelization improves a little bit with the added egg in here. So our other two ingredients that we add to this are what really changes the game here. This is what makes the huge difference to the end result being what we want, which is a really kind of light, feathery, crispy exterior to it. And it's the baking soda and the baking powder. These are both chemical leaveners, meaning that when we add them to this, they cause it to puff. Now, baking powder gets added into tons of baked goods. Baking soda requires something very acidic to cause it to activate. And in this case, that acid is the buttermilk. That's why we're using it. So, the ratio is one tablespoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda. So just to make that clear, two cups of buttermilk, one egg, one tablespoon, one teaspoon. So let's add these in. Okay guys, so steaks, all-purpose flour, our buttermilk mixture, which by the way, look at how much thicker it is now that we added that to it. It literally gets puffy, which is kind of crazy. We also need our chicken seasoning and we have our pan hot. And it's hard for you guys to see, but my piece of bacon is sizzling away nicely in here. Let's pull it out and take a look at it. Yep, nice and golden brown. That tells me we are ready to rock and roll as far as our heat is concerned. So we're ready to go on that. So all we have to do is season and fry. Now, before I start frying, I always make sure that I have a pan with a rack in the oven so that I can fry a couple of these at a time. You don't wanna put six or 10 of these in here and crowd it. You wanna do one, two at a time, and then as they're ready, pop them into your warm oven. I keep mine at 185 Fahrenheit with the convection fan on. If you don't have a convection oven, 200 degrees is perfect. You just want it to be able to keep your steaks warm so that you can fry them all. And then once they're fried, we'll make a quick pan gravy and you're good to go. So let's get to work. Now you'll notice 
a really generous amount of seasoning here. We're really seasoning these steaks because that is our seasoning. We don't have seasoning in our other components here. So we go into our flour, completely coated, and that means the edges too, so may, try to be mindful of that. Shake off your excess flour so it's pretty lightly floured into your buttermilk mixture, which now looks like yogurt or melted vanilla ice cream. And then back in to your flour here. And when you do that, you're gonna get a lot of extra little nubbies and that's what you're looking for. Those nubbies, you don't want those to go away. You have you kind of lean into the nubbies and that's what gives you that feathery exterior on your chicken fried steak. These are the nubbies, by the way. They're stuck to my hand. They'll probably be stuck to my black sweatshirt here in just a second as well. So nice and floured, nice and coated, lots of nubbies into our pan of grease. So I'm taking some of my grease off and some of my little fried bits. And I have, I don't know, maybe, I bet that's two tablespoons of fat. To that, I'm gonna add some of my reserved flour. So this is the flour that we used to bread our steaks. And we're gonna add about the same amount. So we're gonna add about two tablespoons of that. Now, we're gonna give this a little stir. And what we're looking for when we're making a gravy is something that has the consistency of sort of wet beach sand. And I bet that will make sense to you guys. When the waves come in and they sort of go to recede back into the ocean, the sand that's left behind is sort of semi-liquefied and that's what we end up with. And that's what we have in our pan right here. It's not like one big gloop, it's kind of wet looking. So, that's how we know we have the correct ratio of flour to fat to make our roux. So, I'm gonna turn my stove back on over about medium heat. So again, the temperature we were frying at, and I'm gonna allow this fat and this flour to start cooking. Now I don't want it to get particularly brown, but I do want it really bubbly before I add my liquid to it. So as soon as it starts bubbling, and you guys can see, it gets super bubbly. As soon as it starts to bubble, we're gonna first add our milk to it. Then we're gonna add our beef broth. And I'm adding about the same amount of each one. Now, this likely is not enough liquid, but I can always add more. I can't really take it away. And I find that it's a lot easier to just kind of keep adding liquid so you get to the right consistency than it is to add way too much, find out your gravy's way too thin, and then have to go back and adjust it. So give this a good stir, make sure everything is mixed together. And we're gonna keep stirring until this thing comes all the way back up to a boil, which is when we'll really get a sense for how thick it's gonna be. Now this, I can tell already, is gonna be way, way, way too thick because it hasn't even quite come up to a boil and I have basically wallpaper paste. So that tells me I need to add a little bit more. So I'm gonna add just a bit more beef broth to this to start with. And again, the amount of stock versus milk that you use, I think really comes down to personal preference. It also comes down to regional preference. Some people see country fried steak or chicken fried steak having a very particular gravy associated with it. My research is that that seems to be tied more to family in an area than, than there being sort of a hard rule. So for me, I say add what you like. And in my case, I like kind of this mix of brown and white gravy, so. Now you'll notice I haven't seasoned this yet. And that's on purpose because there's no point in me seasoning this until I get the consistency that, that I want because otherwise I could end up over seasoning it or under seasoning it if I keep diluting it. So I'm gonna allow this to continue to cook, constantly stirring it so that it stays nice and smooth. And once I get a consistency that I'm really pleased with, I'll add some seasoning to it. 
Okay guys, my gravy has been cooking for about seven or eight minutes now. And I'm just gonna use this whisk so you can see. It's nice and smooth. It definitely clings to my whisk, but it is not wallpaper paste. And that is really important. People make their gravy way, way, way too thick. You don't want that. It's still a sauce. You want it to be nice and smooth. This looks perfect to me. So let's add some seasoning. And for me, the easiest thing to do here, what my grandmother always did, was use this chicken season. So I'm gonna add a nice big pinch of this. Again, it's got quite a bit of spice to it here. So if you like your gravy more mild, you might wanna consider just using some salt and pepper here. But I like the addition of the onion powder, the garlic powder, and certainly the addition of the MSG to this. It really kicks it up. Let's give it a taste. Mm. That is pretty delicious right there. So we have our gravy, we have our steak fried, just time to plate, I guess. So let's grab it out of the oven and I'll show you how we plate them up. All right, guys, let's plate this thing up. I'm very excited about this. I haven't had this in years, to be honest with you. And, you know, my grandmother passed away very, very recently. And I've become very nostalgic about the foods that she prepared. And so it made me want to share this with you guys. So the, for the final trick, my granny was a gravy on the bottom gal. And her logic behind this, and I think it makes sense, is that you got a lot more crispy country fried steak if your gravy was on the bottom of your plate rather than sitting on top of your steak. And so that's what she would do. So I put it down on the plate here and just kind of smooth it out. This is more of a chef -y thing. I don't think she ever did this. She just kind of piled it onto a platter and we would fish them off of there. Now let's grab our steak out of the oven. Look at this thing. I'm so excited about this. Right on top of our gravy. Nestle it in there. You can hear this thing. <laughs> like move my hand over it. It's so crispy and crunchy. So guys, this is it. My granny's country fried steak with milk gravy. I hope y'all enjoy it. If you do, please let me know. Come back, see me again sometime and we'll make something different. Y'all take care.